Well, yes, welcome everyone to GeoHug. Uh, so before we take, kick off today's session, I'd just like to take this time to acknowledge the traditional lands which we're all coming from today. I'm here on the beautiful lands of the Gadigal, of the people of the Aurora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. So I'm so happy to have Edward Bunker joining us today. So Ed is a mineral exploration geologist at CGG, and here his current focus is on the development of global to regional scale exploration tools for a range of mineral systems, with a particular focus on energy transition metals such as lithium. So with his expertise, it is going to be awesome to learn from him today about from mines to brines an overview of lithium deposits and how to explore for them. So it's going to be an epic session. I hope you all enjoy it. Please use the chat. We'll be opening up the floor for discussions at the end. And yes, thanks so much, Ed, for joining. It's awesome having you. Well, thanks so much, Jess. Um, so as Jess just said, my name's Ed Bunker and I'm a minerals exploration geologist at CGG. And so today I'm hoping to provide you with an overview of lithium mineral systems. And this is based on work that we've been doing at CGG for the last few years, both through client funded projects and also through internal research and development. So a kind of rundown of the presentation today, I want to start with a few fundamentals of the physical and chemical properties of lithium. And it's important to start there because it helps us understand how lithium moves and why it accumulates in kind of economic deposits in the certain places that it does. I also want to touch briefly on the motivations for why we want to explore for lithium in the present day climate. Uh, then I'm going to kind of just give you a high level touch on each of the different type of mineral deposit types that I'm going to talk about today and then tie them all together in our integrated lithium mineral system and that kind of integrated perspective that we've that we've developed. And then we're going to do a slight deep dive into all those different deposit types using a few academic case studies and also a few industry case studies along the way to just show different ways that we can explore for these different types of deposits. So to start with those fundamentals, um, you can consider lithium to behave kind of like a large ion lithophile. It's actually got a very low, a very small ionic radius in itself, but it behaves similar to most of those large ion lithophiles. So it's pretty much incompatible within most silicate mineral structures uh, and doesn't really like to be incorporated into those mineral lattice structures of silicates. But when it does, it tends to occur as a trace element and it often substitutes for magnesium because magnesium seems to have similar chemical and physical properties to lithium. So they tend to behave in the same way. Lithium is also the lightest metal that we know of in the periodic table. I've already mentioned that it has a small ionic radius and it's also highly electropositive. And those are some properties we'll talk about a bit further in the next slide. Lithium is also highly water soluble. There's a low melting point and boiling point. And interestingly, it seems to be stripped from seawater. And that's an important point to mention because you'd expect if, if lithium is pretty incompatible within silicate phases and is highly water soluble, you'd expect lithium to be kind of concentrated at the Earth's surface and then it would be easily soluble and mobilize into water. So all of those factors you'd suggest would suggest that lithium would be naturally concentrated into seawater. But on this table on the right, you can see that seawater actually has a very depleted lithium content of 0.2 lithium, uh, 0.2 parts per million of lithium. And the reason that people think that is, is because lithium seems to be stripped out of seawater by the formation of deep sea clays. And you can see deep sea clays here are actually quite enriched with respect to lithium. So higher than the average crustal abundance, even higher than most granites, typical granite compositions. And, and we also have shales here as well. So it's an interesting kind of uh, thing to bear in mind that whilst you, at first glance, you might think seawater would be a really good source for lithium. Actually, it's, it's pretty lithium depleted. At the bottom of this table here, I've also summarized a few kind of um, figures of, of some potential potentially economic lithium systems uh, or, or resources for lithium. So Cornish lithium are interested in a brine associated with a granite down in the so southwest of Cornwall. And the values for lithium in that brine are, are said to be about 200, 220 parts per million. So that's relatively not particularly high if you look at the other kind of sources of lithium that we have here. So we have um, Salad Atacama brines, and we'll talk about those later on. And they're almost an order of magnitude higher in concentration in lithium. Uh, and these are interesting things to think about. So we've got two different brines here with very different compositions of lithium, both considered in some way to be economic. And hopefully we'll dig into that a bit later on and, and you'll see and hope to, I hope you'll understand why that might be. And then we also have those kind of ore grade rock types. So we've got Thacker Pass, which is a lithium clay type system. And also we have that hard rock spodumene type system such as Mount Holland. And those are um, once again, highly enriched with respect to lithium, but significantly higher than the brines. 
So I've already said we want to talk about the motivations. So why is lithium so good and why do we need it in the modern day? So those properties of lithium I already mentioned, it's a light metal, it's highly electropositive and has a small ionic radius. And those things mean that you can fit a huge amount of charge into a very small amount of, of volume. And that's really good if you want to create a high energy density battery. And those high energy density batteries are the best kind of batteries to make uh, mobile technologies. So what I'm talking about are those electric cars, mobile phones and laptops. So you can have a, a nice portable phone with a huge amount of charge in it. And that's ideal for what we need. So in this kind of modern world and in the energy transition, we really do want li uh, lithium ion batteries uh, for trans for use in, in all those kind of different technologies. And as a result of all that popularity of lithium for use in these batteries, uh, it's projected that demand for lithium is going to uh, increase by eightfold over the next decade. But it's not only a demand problem, it's also a supply problem. So lithium is strategically vulnerable. So the majority of lithium is actually produced from only a few countries. So you can see on this graph on the bottom here, Australia dominates the production market. We also have Chile, Argentina, and to a lesser degree, China as well. So it's just a few countries here producing most of the lithium that we have uh, that we need for the world's um, demand, uh, but also that supply is strategically vulnerable because the majority of lithium processing, so that's like refining of the ore and also creation of the batteries uh, is going on in China. So the, most of our lithium, whilst it's produced in a range of different countries, all goes through China. So there's a, an interesting bottleneck there that we really do need to address if we want safe and domestic supplies of lithium into the future. So I'm now going to give you a, a very high level rundown of each of the different um, deposit types and the pros and cons of each. So hard rock mining, or as I as I call it, is kind of the most classic way that we've mined lithium in the past, uh, and it's associated with granite related pegmatites and other types of hard rock systems like that. And we're mining minerals like spodumene and petalite and lapidolite, which are lithium en enriched silicate minerals. The benefit of this type of system is that it uses conventional exploration and mining techniques. So, you know, drilling, defining a resource through drilling out and, and then processing the ore in, in conventional ways. So we can use knowledge that we already have to explore and process that um, the, the mines and, and, and exploit them. Also, co coincidentally, many of these hard rock mines occur in permissive juris jurisdictions to mining. So uh, areas where uh, mining is, is welcome. So places like Australia and Canada, where um, it's relatively straightforward to um, set up the legislation and all of the pathways to develop a mine. Also, as we already discussed, the ore is high grade and that's really beneficial when you come to the processing. But that high grade is really needed because one of the cons of this type of um, lithium extraction is that it's intensely energy, uh, it's very energy intensive. So um, I've heard um, quoted several times by John Thompson um, that uh, the crushing of ore uh, in order to process and, and obtain minerals uh, takes about 10% of our energy production globally. And that's a huge proportion of energy cons consumption is used in, in that crushing of ore. Uh, and that's really important consideration. So energy intensive, and it also produces a huge amount of waste. So only about three to 0.3% of the rocks that we're mining is actually lithium and useful. The rest of it is generating waste. And that waste needs to be uh, stored somewhere. So we generate tailings and waste piles. Uh, and those are an ongoing consideration for ESG concerns. We need to monitor those and look after those as, be as best we can for the rest of the, um, for, for the ongoing into the future. So another type of, of, of rock mining is, is lithium in clays. So uh, this occurs in places like Thacker Pass in Nevada in the USA. Once again, we're using conventional exploration and mining techniques to look for, explore for, and then mine these types of deposits. Uh, they're also relatively straightforward to extract. Uh, the grades are moderate to high once again, but similar um, downsides as well. So this is an energy intensive process and generates a lot of waste again that we have to pile up in tailings piles and look after. But an additional consideration here is that the majority of the deposits that we actually know about, which are lithium clays, tend to occur in environments where um, there's resistance to mining. So this could be due to indigenous communities living in the area that don't really want mining to occur. And it can also be due to ecological concerns. So some of these mines occur in, in kind of areas of outstanding natural beauty or scientific interest, areas that want to be preserved for other reasons. So um, those factors are really important considerations and reasons that we may consider not, not exploiting that resource. 
So the most conventional type of brine extraction is extraction from evaporative continental basins. And I tend to refer to these as salars, and that's what they're referred to in South America. So the reason I, I refer to them as salars is because the majority of those continental evaporative basins that we know of do occur in South America. So the majority of them are called salars. Um, the benefits here is once again, they're straightforward to explore for and to extract because these basins tend to occur at or near the Earth's surface. So they qu have quite an obvious expression that we can then go and look at and, and, and exploit. Um, the grades here are pretty, are pretty low. That should really say moderate to low grade. Uh, and obviously it's dissolved within, a, in, within water. Interestingly, the, the kind of refinement process is very low energy requirement, has a very low energy requirement. So these brines are being pumped to the surface. As you can see in this figure from the Salar de Atacama, uh, the brines are pumped to the surface and stored in pools at, at the Earth's surface. Uh, and then through the process of kind of just solar evaporation, so passive evaporation using the heat of the sun, the water is evaporated away and the lithium gets left behind as a lithium carbonate. So we're basically using renewable energy sources to refine the lithium here. And that's a really interesting consideration. One of the reasons that we can extract lithium at lower grades than, for, in, for instance, the hard rock mine is because we're using that passive energy source. But one of the downsides here is that so for one thing it's very time uh, time intensive so we pump these brines to the surface and then they have to sit there for 18 months to two years while that gradual evaporation occurs so it takes a very long time to refine these lithium brines out it also pumps water out of a, a groundwater out of an environment that's high, highly arid so in south america where we are here in this in this image it's a very arid environment and pumping groundwater out to the surface and then evaporating it away isn't necessarily the best use of that water and so that takes us on to the next point which is resistance from local communities so we're pumping groundwater out and that could uh, influence the groundwater table in in the nearby regions so local communities may have issues around their own water sources if they're living near to one of these cellar extraction facilities and likewise this can cause ecological issues as well for similar reasons and then we have this kind of new kind of emerging opportunity or technology uh, uh, this kind of new kind of geological search space that i've broadly referred to as unconventional lithium brines so these occur in a diverse range of geological settings. That's both a challenge and a benefit. It's a challenge because it's hard to kind of prescribe a mineral deposit model that you can go and look for, but it's also a benefit because it means that these kind of lithium brines are broadly distributed across the globe in a range of different environments. There's also interesting opportunities in these kind of settings for the production of other types of minerals out of brines and also the production of heat from these brines, because some of these brines come from deep aquifers or kind of adjacent to magmatic systems, and so they can be quite hot. And so there's opportunities for geothermal extraction, and we're going to expand on that a bit later on. This is also a fairly low energy intensity process. So we're using technologies I'm going to expand on later called direct lithium extraction technologies. And these are essentially ways of getting the lithium out of the water. A lot of these don't require a huge amount of energy consumption to do. So we can pump our water out of the ground, put them through a direct lithium extraction technology to suck the lithium out and then pump that water back into the ground. And that puts us onto the final pro, which is minimal waste. So the byproduct of this process is water. Uh, and so it's in theory, as long as you haven't added anything to that water, it should be able to be pumped back into the aquifer from, from which it came from in a kind of circular process. Now, the downside here is that we're looking at brines with pretty low grades. I mean, you saw the Cornish lithium example earlier on. It's much lower grade than a salar, for instance. Um, and so that means that the, it, it could be challenging to make an economic uh, business plan around this kind of low grade lithium. Uh, the extraction technologies are also kind of still haven't been proven yet in a commercial sense. Many of them are kind of in pilot phase. They've been demonstrated to work in the lab, but can we trans translate that success in the lab to success in the field? It still is yet to be seen. And also, uh, whilst we have got a range of kind of pilot studies in, in, the, in the field right now, where people are looking to extract lithium from specific geothermal brines or specific brines in, in, in the field, uh, none of those projects are really at a commercial stage yet. So it's kind of, yet to be proven whether these unconventional lithium brines can be commercially viable in that respect. So just to kind of bring all of that together, I've got a few, a few facts and figures here. So um, the table on the top right here, right hand corner here shows the proportion of reserves 
relative to all of these different types of systems that I've discussed. So you can see quite interestingly that those, those continental basin brines, those cellars dominate the proportion of lithium reserves. And I've thought a, a bit about this and, and kind of my feeling on this is probably because these, these um, salar brines, they occur at or near the Earth's surface, as I've already said. So it's quite easy to um, establish where, where across the globe those lithium brines are. And they're also quite shallow basins, so maybe maximum depth of 100 meters. So actually kind of, you know, defining that resource or reserve is, is relatively straightforward. Whereas when you think about a hard rock system like a pegmatite system, um, it's, it's a bit more challenging to define that reserve. So whilst we have 30% um, reserves for those lithium pegmatites, it's probably um, the actual percentage of lithium reserves is probably higher relative to the salar basins. And then you can see that those kind of those clay systems actually compose quite a small amount or small proportion of the global lithium reserves. And then even smaller still are those unconventional brines that we were talking about. So in, in terms of unconventional brines, geothermal brines and oilfield brines sit there. And then this is the only time I'm really going to mention it, but there is an interesting deposit in Serbia called Yadar, where we've discovered this mineral that's completely new to geology called Yadarite. Um, and this is a lithium zeolite. Um, so there's not a huge amount of um, literature out there for us to understand the geological controls and, and the kind of background for this deposit. Um, kind of from the preliminary work that I've looked at, it seems that it could relate to those lithium clay type systems, but this could be a metamorphosed lithium clay type system. That's really mo mainly speculative, so I wouldn't really say that with a high degree of confidence. But yeah, it's interesting because it's a massive deposit um, and composes 3% of li global lithium reserves in itself. Um, so I've kind of touched on a few of these points on the left here. Um, and I also wanted to mention that it's it's likely that that non-conventional lithium brine reserve proportion, which is relatively small in, in this uh, table here, but this table was an estimate from 2017 by Bradley et al. And so it's likely that that uh, proportion of unconventional brines has increased because of technical in innovations within that space and also kind of excitement and interest in these kind of new unconventional brines. So it's likely that when we come to a new estimate, a modern estimate, that proportion will, will increase significantly. Uh, down in the bottom here, you can see those comparative grades. I've already kind of vaguely touched on this. So the black uh, crosses uh, correspond to salar brines, and you can see that comparative to those hard rock and soft rock systems, uh, they have quite low grades. And the grade is shown here on the y-axis, and the total tonnage of each deposit is shown on the uh, x-axis. So whilst they have re relatively low grades, uh, deposits like the Salada Atacama and the Salada Ayudi actually have some of the highest um, total tonnages of any of the deposits that we've seen. Then we have those lithium clay systems, which are relatively low grade compared to the, to the hard rock systems up here. So in blue, we have the hard rock systems and they have significantly higher grades and pretty high tonnages as well. So it's just interesting to kind of synthesize and compare all those different grades versus tonnages. So now I want to tie all of those different deposit types together in our kind of holistic mineral system that we have here. Um, so this figure is a conceptual figure that we've brought together internally, and it helps us to kind of conceptualize how lithium moves at and near the Earth's surface. So we're going to pick the story up here in these magmatic systems. So as you can imagine, or you may already know, um, a lot of the lithium enriched um, granites that we know of are S-type granites. They likely have interacted with sediments on the way through the crust. Um, and lithium, as I've already mentioned, behaves like a large iron lithophile, so it's relatively incompatible and doesn't really like to be trapped into silicate phases. So one of the primary mechanisms of concentration of lithium in these magmas is through fractional crystallization. So we're fractionating out silicates and lithium likes to stay in the residual magma for as long as it possibly can do. So an example of environments like a lithium pegmatite that we've already talked about, that's an example where lithium's basically been backed up into a corner. So fractional crystallization has been progressing along and a magma has becoming more fractionated and more hydrous, uh, but eventually there's no way for the lithium to stay within that fluid any longer. And it's forced into the kind of uh, the mineral lattice of, of, a, of, a, of a lithium enriched silicate like a spodumene or a petalite. So that's how we end up with a, a lithium pegmatite. But in, in other cases, we can have a, a, an evolved magma um, kind of fractionating away, but some of that magma is extruded to the surface. And so we have um, rhyolitic uh, explosive eruptions. So a great example of an area like this would be the Western Andean margin, where we have these highly evolved, very explosive eruptions of rhyolitic magmas. 
So during these eruptions, we get a lot of devolatilization, and it's likely that some lithium will be lost as volatile species, species but we also get rapid crystallization of magma, and that, see, that tends to trap the lithium within glassy matrices. So we get the formation of, of uh, volcanic deposits like ignimbrites during these eruptions, and those ignimbrites have a high volume of glass, and within that glass, we get a lot of lithium. The benefit here is that that lithium isn't trapped within the mineral lattice structure, it's trapped within an amorphous silicate glass, and these glasses are actually pretty unstable at the Earth's surface. So when they interact with water, um, weathering can occur quite rapidly, and that lithium, because it's very soluble and incompatible, will readily partition into the water. So through weathering of those ignimbrites, water can easily be liberated into, in, into a hydrous phase. Now, when that weathering occurs, it's not likely that that lithium that's then trapped in solution will be of, of a significantly enriched grade. It's probably still going to be at less than 10 parts per million within the fluid. But the important factor here is that the relative ratio of lithium to other cations within that fluid has increased because lithium is more soluble than all the other cations. So the lithium to calcium ratio will increase, the lithium to potassium ratio will increase and so on. Uh, and that's really crucial when we come to enrich it later down the line. Another important um, contributor of lithium into the Earth's surface, uh, especially in areas like the Western Andean margin that we're talking about here, is the contribution of geothermal waters. So when we have a shallowly in place magmatic system, uh, that will then begin to devolatilize and condense out a hydrous phase often. Uh, and so that hot water, which is lithium enriched and also enriched with other elements, can sometimes reach the Earth's surface by following um, shallow uh, crustal fractures. And when that extrudes, that's basically what we consider a, a geothermal spring. Uh, and in one of the products I'm going to talk about later on, we've looked at waters from geothermal springs in similar type environments, and the lithium content can be 50 parts per million, sometimes a bit higher than that. So in comparison to the lithium being contributed from these kind of waters that are interacting with the rhyolite glasses, that uh, lithium that's coming from those geothermal waters is a significantly stepped up uh, in, with respect to lithium enrichment. So all of this lithium is being transported in the water cycle, it's being transported along the Earth's surface in, in river channels, and it can often accumulate in, in basins. And in many areas like the Western Andean margin, we, we have kind of topographic basins that are closed off or isolated. Uh, we call them endorheic basins. And basically what that means is that water can flow into the basin, but it doesn't really have potential to flow out of the basin due to the topography. So that water accumulates, and the only way that it can escape from that area is through evaporation. And in hyper arid regions like the Atacama Desert, the evaporation rate is much higher than the precipitation rate. So that water accumulates in the basin and then the volume of that water begins to diminish. But lithium can't follow that water through evaporation. It has to stay within the, within the fluid. And because it's highly soluble, it wants to stay within the fluid for as long as it possibly can. So as that water begins to evaporate and, and the residual water uh, becomes increasingly enriched with total dissolved solids, so lithium and other, uh, other elements are becoming enriched, a lot of those elements also begin to precipitate out as evaporite phases. So uh, the sodium will be trapped within halite, the calcium becomes trapped within gypsum and other minerals, uh, but the lithium gets left behind because it's the most soluble and it's most incompatible with respect to other elements. And that's essentially how you get the formation of a salar. So it's basically through gradual evaporative enrichment of that residual brine and the lithium gets left behind. Now, before I go any further, there's an important Im uh, exploration implication that I want to talk about from a really interesting paper. So this is Ellis et al. in Economic Geology this year. Um, they showed that um, within these uh, ignin bright systems, the lithium mobilization probably happens at or near the time of, of ignin bright um, deposition. So when the ignimbrite was still hot, that's the best time to mobilize that lithium. So what that tells you is that lithium was released at the time of, of eruption. And so that lithium most likely accumulated within that basin at or near the time of that eruption as well. And the age of some of these ignimbrites is significantly older than you'd expect. So some of them are millions of years to 10 million years old. And that's what that tells you is that that lithium brine has a very long residence time within that basin. So it can sit there for geologically long periods of time. And what that means is that we have the potential for subsequent geological events to occur and to potentially cover that basin over. So we could get the precipitation, uh, sorry, the deposition of a gravel. We could get more ignimbrite flows coming over and covering this basin up. And essentially what that means is that we can isolate that basin away and bury it. And that's what we refer to as a paleocellar. So that's a buried um, aquifer where we have lithium enriched brine sitting within the pore space of the rock here. 
it's a no longer an active um, sell our system, but the brine is still sat there happily just just you know living its life. And so that's what we refer to as a paleo solar. It's an interesting concept we're going to come back to later in the presentation. So we have another few uh, types of lithium to talk about here. We have lithium associated with oil fields. So essentially, some oil fields in the world have been seen to be or observed to be associated with lithium enriched brines, whereas other oil fields have no lithium enrichment within the brines. So there's some interesting controls there that we will try and dig into a bit later on. But trying to understand the relationship of these lithium brines to the modern day analogs that we see here is a really interesting kind of thing to, to kind of play around with. And then sometimes we refer to basinal brines, and that's essentially where we have lithium sat within a, a, a kind of porous basin. Uh, the lithium in this in this case has kind of become separate from the from the geological context would, uh, that would allow us to infer how that lithium got there in the first place. So a basinal brine is more of like a bucket term for just generally lithium brines that we find in basins, and we don't really know how they got there. Uh, and then the last kind of thing to talk about is we do have some interesting environments like granite hosted lithium brine. So the Cornish lithium example I talked about earlier is an example where we have we had lithium uh, enriched within the granite and then water was able to interact with that granite through uh, exploiting uh, fractures within that granite and dissolve the lithium out again. And so we do sometimes get interesting environments like that. So that kind of completes that holistic journey that we've been on of following lithium through its journey through at and near the Earth's surface. So now we're going to do a few deep dives into those different deposit types. First one we're going to talk about is the hard rock lithium deposits. So we do have a classic model for these kind of deposits. As I've already said, we've been exploiting and exploring for these types of deposits for the probably the longest time uh, in our human history. Uh, so typically we find these kind of um, pegmatite type systems which are associated with S-type granites. So it's important that they're S-type as I mentioned earlier because interaction with those sediments is likely a, a key factor in enriching lithium within the magma because it's so incompatible any kind of partial melting lithium just likes to jump jump into that partial melt as soon as it possibly can do so interaction with those sediments those kind of clays and shales will allow lithium to jump from those clays and shales and into the parent magma which will then become subsequently enriched with respect to lithium but these granites are also enriched with a, another broad suite of elements like the ones here rubidium cesium etc these are all kind of incompatible elements that behave in a similar way to lithium they typically form in late to post collisional tectonic settings uh, and these granites typically are, are emplaced within the shallow to mid crust in the green schist to amphibolite fasces and that's useful as an exploration uh, kind of implication um, so the lithium gets uh, essentially as i've already mentioned it's very incompatible it likes to stay in the magma for as long, long as it possibly can do and so we tend to get zoning around around these pegmatites and lithium tends to be sitting within the the outer the outermost zones of these pegmatites and that's useful but it's also a challenge so it's useful because we can then begin to map distance to granite is a useful exploration vector, but it's also a challenge because that lithium is sitting in the outermost area or zone of that halo. So it means that using um, the those kind of alteration halos as, a, as an exploration vector can be quite challenging. Now it has been shown that these halos do extend much further away from the granite than um, whether lithium is economically concentrated, but we're really looking at trace element uh, compositions here and, and it requires high sensitivity analysis to actually kind of look for these alteration halos. So a very challenging environment in which to explore for. So that's kind of the most uh, classic model for lithium enrichment in pegmatites. But recent work by Muller et al from the Green Peg project has actually argued for the potential for lithium to be unassociated to any kind of granite. So in certain environments like shear zones, we can get partial melting of, of the mid to lower crust or the mid crust in particular, where we get dehydration reactions from sediments like the muscovites and, and shales and things like that. And that partial melting in itself can lead to the liberation of lithium into kind of a magmatitic partial melt. So if that can accumulate within a shear zone, we could actually get kind of economic concentrations of partial melt within that shear zone, and it could be unrelated to a granite. So the interesting example that they use is, is Leinster. Uh, paradoxically, that is associated with a granite, but some of the recent work has shown that the partial melts are most likely derived from sediments and than derived from the associated granite. Now, this is something that I don't have um, full authority on. So if there are people that disagree, I'm happy for you to disagree with me on that, um, but I'll leave it at that. But it's just intro interesting and important to bear in mind that we can actually get lithium concentrations 
unassociated with granite. And it's really that process of partial melting is, is the concentration vector there. So I'm going to briefly touch on lithium in clays. Now, these systems are really interesting. They kind of span the gap between hard rock systems and brine systems. Uh, we've already talked about some of the mechanisms behind lithium enrichment in brine systems being those ignimbrites. brites. Uh, and once again, ignimbrites brites are an interesting and important potential lithium source in these, in these environments. So what we have here is a, is a highly evolved rhyolitic melt similar to the ones we were talking about in the Andes. But in this case, we're looking for extremely large eruptions, those kind of caldera forming explosive eruptions, such as the Yellowstone eruption, for instance, or maybe a little bit smaller than Yellowstone, but really big eruptions. So we've got an evolved magma. We um, blast a huge amount of material to the surface, deposition of a huge amount of ignimbrites with glassy matrices, with lithium within the glass. That lithium can then be remobilized and that caldera setting is basically forming that end array basin that we were talking about earlier, where water can drain into the basin, but it can't really drain out again. So we get accumulation of lithium enriched waters within that basin setting, and, and it can accumulate and interact with the lake sediments. We also have a really major component of contribution of magmatic fluids here as well. So once that magma has erupted, we get a kind of decompression within that magma chamber, and that may lead to a lot of devolatilization of that magma. And some of those fluids will uh, travel along fractures and get into the shallow environment as well. And so we're really thinking here about sediments that are interacting with the lithium enriched water. So that water has lithium, probably has a lot of silica, and it's also quite hot. And through those diagenetic reactions that occur when we have a hot water within the sediment, we begin to get reactions that are altering those clays that are forming in the lake sediments into the kind of smectite type formula of a hectorite. So that's essentially the kind of reactions that are going on there. And, and that's really interesting to understand. <clears throat> so in terms of how we explore for these things, it's good to understand where the volcanic calderas are. Understanding their size and catchment can give you an understanding of what's the potential for lithium enrichment within that caldera. Understanding the composition of that magma, was it an S-type granite? Because those are quite important with lithium enrichment. And then the age of that granite. So is it is it um, of that kind of late to post um, orogenic phase. The clays themselves, they don't have a characteristic uh, multispectral or hyperspectral signature, but they're also quite obvious to spot from satellites because they're very bright white. Uh, they tend to occur in kind of stratiform or at least lenticular bodies. So once you find some of this kind of hectorite clay, you can look along uh, a long strike and, and attempt to find kind of larger proportions down uh, down dip, for instance. And as I've already mentioned, this is a diagenetic reaction. So uh, it's, it's kind of proximity to those paleo hydrothermal systems is really important. Uh, and then I've kind of got this open question at the bottom. How important is paleoclimate in these type of systems? So as I've already just mentioned, we have this endorate basin type system. We have lithium being mobilized from brines. So is it important that we have um, kind of that arrow climate, which is quite important in salar type systems, or is it really just more about magmatic fluids being kind of driven off of these magma systems? So, I mean, that's an open question, really. I don't think that there's any definitive answer there, but I think it's an interesting question that's open. So now I'm going to switch gears and start talking about brine type systems. So firstly, I'm going to talk about salars and paleo salars. And here's, uh, in this example, I'm going to start talking also about one of the projects that we've been doing at CGG. So just to kind of re-summarize the, the mineral system of, of, of these salar type systems. So we have lithium enriched rocks at, at or near the Earth's surface. These are typically glassy ignimbrites. And by weathering and reacting with those ignimbrites, waters can um, dissolve lithium out of those uh, out of those rocks and transport it along the earth's surface they then accumulate within those endorate basins and through evaporation we get enrichment of the of lithium in the residual fluids and we also have important contributions from those hot springs so um, CGG determined that this would be a really interesting kind of case study to use satellite derived techniques for target generation. Uh, and, and in this study, we're particularly focused on paleo salars. So we've got that interesting um, point of view that we know where all of the modern day salars are. They're obvious and they're at the Earth's surface. But what about those salars that were forming in geological periods of time in the past? 
um, those ones that could potentially be shallowly buried and potentially still accessible, but we just can't see them at the Earth's surface. So we derived some satellite techniques in order to help us uh, explore for lithium in this area that we know that we know of as the lithium triangle or the greater lithium crescent. So on this figure on the right, the lithium triangle is shown in pink and it's defined by three major salars. We've got the Salar de Uni, Uni, that's number three on the top of the figure. We have number 12 here, which is the Salar de Atacama. That's probably the biggest lithium resource that we know of. And we have Salada Ombue Muerto here in northwestern Argentina, number 43. And that defines the lithium triangle. But if you look at this figure, you'll see that the majority of the salars actually sit outside of the lithium triangle. And we have a few smaller ones inside the, of the lithium triangle. So there's a huge amount of potential for salar formation in this region. And then it's just about understanding the mineral system in order to explore for it. The benefits other benefits in this region for using satellites are it's, it's a very arid region, so we don't have much cloud cover and we also don't have much vegetation. And that's really ideal when you're looking um, when you're using satellite derived techniques. Um, so in order to start our exploration efforts here, and this is um, work done by the satellite mapping team at CGG, and all of this data is available on subscription basis. If you're interested, just give me an email. So. The first challenge that we realized is that this area spans three different countries. We've got southwestern Bolivia, northern Chile and northwestern Argentina. And all of these um, different countries have geological maps that have different symbology. They're presented at different scales and the boundaries rarely line up, if ever. And so that's a real challenge if you're exploring across borders. So what CGG have done is create a unified geological map over this area of interest where the geological symbology and the geological units are all unified. Uh, and that's really beneficial when you're looking at, at areas that could be across the border, for instance. Also brought together a, a range of other um, layers that have been derived from satellites. So we have a bare earth model in the visible light spectrum derived from Sentinel-2. We also have a multi-spectral bare earth model, which is derived from the ASTA satellite. And that's useful for looking at mineral signatures outside of the visible light spectrum. And then using digital elevation models and in-house processing, we've created derivatives that help us understand the river flow paths and drainage catchments within this area. So that's shown in the central figure here. We've also brought together some important geological layers. So in this figure here in red, we've got the distribution of modern uh, of salars at the modern day. And this is important because this is considered to be our lithium source in this case study. And then we also have the distribution of the modern salars shown in blue. And then the final piece of the puzzle is another derivative from the digital elevation models. And this is a flat area analysis. So what we're doing here is analyzing the slope in any one area and where it's flat, you're in, that is indicated by blue, red and yellow stippling. So the area that I'm circling with my mouse, I hope you can see that, is the Salada Atacama that we've talked about a few times already. And you can see that it's very well defined by a flat area. So this is, indicates that these flat areas are, are generally good areas for water to accumulate. Um, I'm now going to show you how we put this all into practice by using a case study in northwestern Argentina. So this is an area in northwestern Argentina. This is a Google Earth image, and I've ex um, exaggerated the uh, topography by three times just to help you to help emphasize the points. So we can map our drainage catchments here, shown in red. We can also map the distribution of the ignimbrite, shown in orange, and that's our potential lithium source. And then we can map our flow paths and we can see that many of these flow paths intersect the ignin brights. So that's quite beneficial in understanding how we liberate that lithium. And then we can map the flat area, which is shown in light blue in the center of, of the catchment. So that's where our waters could be accumulating. Obviously, you can see that at the modern day, most of this area is covered by gravels. So th there's not much indication of there actually being a salar there, but we can predict that there could well be a salar there. And we can validate this approach because we have two junior companies sat working in this area already. We have NRG Metals working in the north and we have Lake Resources working in the south. Uh, and to give you an idea for the, uh, the size of the prize here, this green polygon is a JORC compliant resource of 4 million tons of lithium carbonate equivalent that they've defined within this area. And Lake are also looking to expand that by 10 million tons through further exploration. So a really significant resource has been discovered in this area. Uh, and, and that was all done um, by this company, but we can also validate and do that again using our own in-house data. So now I'm going to switch gears once more and talk about unconventional lithium brine extraction. So my colleague the other day asked me, does this have anything to do with unconventional hydrocarbons? No, it doesn't have anything to do with unconventional hydrocarbons. This is a completely different topic. And it's just a very, uh, a broad range of different types of lithium brines that aren't very well geologically characterized. We just have, have we just tend to be finding more and more different areas where lithium occurs in solution. So 
as I've just mentioned, it, they occur in a diverse range of geological settings. And that's a challenge because it's hard to actually prescribe a, a kind of deposit model to these types of lithium brines. But if you take a kind of holistic or a mineral systems point of view and approach to this kind of exploration, um, there is potential for a lot of success and discovery. So understanding the sources, the traps, the pathways and the concentration factors is really important. So as I've already mentioned, there's a lot of potential lithium sources that we could think about. Often ignimbrites are really crucial or granites because they have high lithium content to begin with. Evaporation can be a key, uh, key factor in, in concentrating these fluids. And also a key thing that is often not considered in other types of mineral system is the dilution of the fluid. So um, you can have a lithium enriched water, but if it has the potential to interact with a meteoric water uh, within, within a, an aquifer system, then that lithium could be easily diluted to sub-economic grades. Um, also within that kind of economic play, we have to think about the opportunities for co-production of other resources. So um, it's been proven that we can easily get silica out of these fluids. It's also been shown that we can get zinc out of some of these fluids. And there are other potential elements that we could get out like rare earth elements, for instance, sometimes gold is considered and silver. Um, and so if we can get other fluid, uh, other elements out of these fluids, there's potential for kind of a double payoff. And also in that kind of double payoff regime is the potential to get geothermal energy out of these fluids. And that's often considered a major resource in these fluids is the, is the geothermal resource. And then lithium might be a beneficial byproduct or vice versa. Lithium might be the primary byproduct and geothermal energy might be a, just a beneficial side, side uh, product. But alongside um, the chemistry of all these beneficial elements that we might want to get out of these fluids, we can also find that some of these fluids have deleterious or pe penalty elements in them. So fluorine, bromine, hyd hydrogen sulfide can be in these fluids. And these are all really important technical considerations for a range of reasons. And even silica can be a major technical consideration because um, if you have too much total to dissolved solids and too much silica within the fluid, that can begin to precipitate out when you start pumping that water to the surface and that can block up your system. And then some of these elements are major public health concerns, for instance. So understanding what's in the fluid before you pump it to the surface is really crucial. Uh, and it's crucial for a, a number of reasons. So this, this figure, uh, this slide summarizes the different types of direct lithium extraction technologies that I was talking about earlier. So when we talk about direct lithium extraction, we're actually referring to a range of different potential technologies that are on the market. So we have ion exchange resins, sorbents, solvent separation methods, semi-permeable membranes, and electrochemical, uh, electrochemical methods of extracting lithium from these fluids. All of these different technologies have different sensitivities to the physical and chemical properties of the fluids. So some of these technologies will only work on a, on a low temperature fluid, or they might work on a high temperature fluid and not a low temperature fluid. Some of these technologies get clogged up if the water is too mineral rich. So you can only have, um, if it, it would be ideal to have as, as um, the ratio of lithium to other dissolved solids within the fluid to be as high as it possibly can be. And then other technologies still um, are really sensitive to pH. So you really do need to have a comprehensive understanding of the physical and chemical properties of these fluids if you're ever going to be able to ex um, economically and feasibly extract the lithium from, from some of these fluids. So um, CDG uh, took on board all of this information and decided to create a screening tool that helps in that in that challenge. So um, this uh, screening tool is a global screening tool derived from publicly available and in-house CDG data sets, which summarizes the global water chemistry that's available today, along with some accessory uh, data sets such as the hard rock geochemistry, which is really useful in understanding source rock potential for lithium within these environments. And we've also brought together flow rates and um, production vectors for geothermal energy and also accurately located um, position of uh, the active and inactive geothermal plants that are available today or are kind of have been manufactured. And that's interesting in understanding potential opportunities for joint ventures and reharnessing of old in infrastructure. So this screening tool helps us in, in interrogating the full chemistry of a brine. So the pH temperature, flow rates, and all of the kind of chemical composition of that brine. And what's I, what I find is exciting about this product is that one company will come to a different conclusion to another company about what the perfect brine is, depending on what their objectives are. So if their objectives are to find a hot water that they can get lithium out of as a byproduct, they'll conclude that one area of the world is the perfect place to go. Whereas if a, another company just wants to find as much lithium as they possibly can do, and they don't care if the water's hot or not, then they'll probably go to a different part of the world. So each company will come to a different conclusion based on the same data set, which makes it very valuable.
So I'm just going to close off now with a few kind of remarks on oil field brines. Uh, this is an environment that's qu pretty interesting. It's probably one of the least well known or least well understood systems in terms of lithium brines. So as I've mentioned, we find lithium brines associated with some oil fields, but not all oil fields. So some oil fields are considered to be barren with respect to lithium brines, whereas, whereas others are not. So understanding what are the potential sources of that lithium is really important. I've already told you that uh, lithium in brine has a long residence time and it can sit within an aquifer for as long as that aquifer is a good, is a good trap for that brine. Um, so we've had a lot of, um, there's a lot of discussion in the literature about what could be the potential lithium sources. So it's often observed that um, when we have lithium enrichment within the brine, it's often underlain by a large evaporite. And I think that's a big kind of smoking gun here. So we have that evaporite and evaporites form in those arid environments that we were describing earlier with respect to salar type systems. But in terms of how that lithium is actually kind of captured and stored, that's not so well understood. Does it just sit within a brine for a long period of time uh, for like the whole time of that geological history? Or is it trapped within minerals? Is it trapped within, you know, uh, trace elements in, in gypsum, for instance, and then it kind of gets dissolved out again and, and then gets remobilized up into the overlying geological layers? That's a potential opportunity. There's also possibly um, it's also possible that that lithium comes from an external source, so maybe it's related to a pegmatite or an igneous bright host rock, and then that water gets kind of mobilized and, and uh, ends up in the basin. And then others still have argued that it could be lithium derived from that metamorphic breakdown of minerals um, in, in, that high, in, in high temperature kind of uh, metamorphic environments, and that lithium could just be one of the first things to jump out of that fluid because it's so incompatible. Uh, and really, we wouldn't be having this discussion today without the uh, emergence of all these direct lithium extraction technologies, because this is really what's making this a potentially economic opportunity. So I'm just going to show you one case study of where we have an example of one kind of potentially ideal lithium enriched brine sat within a geological basin. So we're talking about the Gulf of Mexico here. Um, and what has been observed is that we have lithium enrichment in the brines associated with a specific formation of, of the basin. So interestingly, it's just kind of the, the smack or the smack over formation, which is quite a low, uh, low lying geological formation within the basin that has those lithium enrichment values. And we do observe um, brine sitting in, in the overlying region as well, but those brines are typically very low with respect to lithium enrichment, so typically less than 60 milligrams per litre. So there's an interesting um, paradigm there that we need to investigate is why is it that lithium is only enriched within the smack over formation and not enriched with the, within the overlying waters. And so we put some thought into this and, and kind of used our oil and gas background to put some principles down to understand why that lithium might be enriched only within the smack over. So the smack over itself is a very good aquifer. It's actually often an aquifer where we extract oil and gas hydrocarbons. Um, it's 300 meters thick and composed of limestone with a good permeability and porosity. And we find those brines in kind of pockets in, in this smack over formation. <clears throat> the overlying rocks are the Haynesville and, the Haynesville and Bossier shales, which are um, very low permeability and actually act as a very effective cap rock in this environment. So we have that cap rock sitting immediately overlying the smack over formation. And then closely underlying the smack over formation is the Luan salt that we were discussing earlier. This massively thick 1.5 kilometer thick evaporite sequence underlying the smack over. And as I was arguing earlier, that kind of evaporative environment is probably really good for um, kind of progressive enrichment of lithium within any primordial brine sat within that salt area, salt environment. And really, that just needs to be able to get up into the smack over formation and accumulate there. So we have our source, we have our pathway and sink, and then we have our, our trap as well. So a really interesting kind of self-contained system there that quite nicely explains why lithium could be getting into the smack over formation and then not mixing with all of that low, low grade lithium brine associated with those overlying geological units. So that's kind of summarized here. We've got a nice source in, in the potential in the, in the Luan salt. Um, but what is the actual ultimate source of that, of that lithium and how is it stored? Those are kind of open questions that we need to dig more into. The aquifer quality seems to be really crucial in this example. So we've got a nice permeable aquifer and that's also overlain by a very good quality trap rock. So these are quite kind of base principle hydrocarbon principles that we can apply to this lithium system, which is really interesting and exciting. 
So uh, that basically wraps up my presentation. I'm just going to leave with a few conclusions, really. So, I mean, this is an exciting place to be. Exploration is ramping up rapidly in, this, in the lithium sector, and we're really going to need to discover new hard rock, soft rock, and brine resources if we're going to meet the demands required for the energy transition. I find that the brine hosted systems are the most interesting and exciting right now, um, and they have a interesting potential for kind of energy uh, for carbon neutrality or even carbon negativity in times for be able to produce lithium and energy at the same time which is really interesting and also production of other uh, um, minerals as well can also help in the economic uh, argument there um, yeah, and really just the final point is just sums it up nicely. We're going to have to innovate and explore in new ways if we're going to meet the demand for lithium. So yeah, I'll leave it at that. Those are the references. Feel free to screenshot that uh, on YouTube or whatever later on. Um, but thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions now.